the Grey King, day five. Slowly they scrambled down the rock. Though it was full of morning now, the sky was no lighter, but gray and heavy with cloud. The rain was still light, but it was clear that it would grow and settle into the day, and that the valley was safe now for any more threat of fire. All the near all the near slope of the mountain, bird rock and the valley edge were blackened and charred, and here and there wisps of smoke still rose. But all sparks were drowned now, and the ashes cold and wet, and the green farmlands would not again this year be in any state for burning. Bran said, Did the heart bring the rain? I think so, Will said. I'm just hoping it will bring nothing else. That's the trouble with the high magic. Like talking in the old speech. It's a protection, and yet it marks you. It makes you easy to find. Well, we'll be in the valley soon. But as he spoke, Bran's foot slipped on a wet rock, and he stumbled sideways, grabbing at a bush to save himself from falling, and dropped the harp. In the instant that the music broke off, the fall's head jerked up, and he began barking furiously in a mixture of rage and challenge. He jumped up to a projecting rock and stood poised there, staring about him. Then suddenly the barking broke into a furious deep growl, like the bang of a hunting dog, and he leapt. The great gray fox, king of the Nilgren, swerved in mid-air and screamed like a vixen. In a headlong rush down a bird rock, he had sprung out out at them from above, and straight for Bran's head and neck. But the shock of Kafal's fierce leap turned his balance just enough to send him spinning sideways, cartwheeling down the rock. He screamed again, an unnatural sound, and made the boys flinch in horror, and he did not stop himself to turn at bay, but rushed on in a frenzy down the mountain. In an instant, Kafal's, in an instant, Kafal, barking in joyous triumph, was tearing down after him, and Will, up on the empty rock under the great drizzling sky, was instantly filled with a pres presentiment of disaster, so overpowering that without thought, he reached out and seized the golden harp and cried to Bran, Stop Kafal, stop it, stop it. Bran gave him one frightened look, then he flung himself after Kafal, running, stumbling, desperately calling the dog back. Scrambling down from the rock with the harp under one arm, Will saw his white head moving fast over the nearest field and beyond it. A blur of speed that he knew was Kafal pursuing the gray fox. His head dizzy with foreboding, he too ran. Still on, on high land, he could see two fields away the roofs of Caradog Pritchard's farm, and nearby a gray-white knot of sheep and the figures of men. He skidded to a halt suddenly. The harp. There was no means of explaining the harp, if anyone should see it. He was certain to be among men in a few moments. The harp must be hidden. But where? He looked wildly about him. The fire had not touched this field. On the far side of the field he saw such a saw a small lean-to, no more than three stone walls and a slate roof that was an open shelter for sheep in the winter or a store place for winter feed. It was filled with bales of hay already newly stacked. Running to it, Will thrust the gleaming willow harp between two, the two bales of hay so that it was completely invisible from the outside. Then, standing back, he stretched out one hand and in the old speech put upon the harp the spell of Care Garadog by the power of which only the song of an old one would be able to take the harp out of that place or even make it visible at all. Then he rushed away over the field towards Pritchard's farm, where distant shouts marking, marked the ending of the chase. He could see in a meadow beyond the farm buildings the huge gray fox, fox swerving and leaping in an effort to shake Kafal from its heels, and Kafal running doggedly close. A madness seemed to be on the fox. White foam dripped from its jaws. Will stumbled breathless into the farmyard to find Bran struggling to make his way through a group of men and sheep at the gate. John Rowlands was there, and Owen Davies with Will's uncle. Their clothes and weary faces were still blackened with ash from the firefighting, and Caradoc Pritchard stood, scowling with his gun cocked under his arm. That dang dog has gone mad, Pritchard growled. Kafal, Kafal! Bran pushed his way wildly through into the field, scattering the sheep and paying no heed to anyone. Pritchard snarled, snarled at him, and Owen Davies said sharply, Bran, where have you been? What are you up to? The great fox leapt high in the air as they had seen it do once before on Bird Rock. Kafal leapt after it, snapping at it in midair. The dog is mad, David Evans said unhappily. He will be on the sheep. He's just so determined to get that fox. Bran's voice was high with anguish. Kafal, tear him up. Leave it. Will's uncle looked at Bran as if he could not believe what he had heard. Then he looked down at Will. He said, puzzled, what fox? Horror exploded in Will's brain as suddenly as he understood and cried out, but it was too late. The great fox in the field swung about and came leaping straight at them with Kafal on its heels. At the last moment, it curved sideways and leapt at one of the sheep that now milled terrified round the gate and sank its teeth into the woolly throat. The sc sheep screamed. Kafal sprang at the fox. Twenty yards away, Kirdar Pritchard let out a gr great furious shout, lifted his gun, and shot Kafal full in the chest. Kafal! Bran's cry of loving horror struck at Will so that for a second he closed his eyes in pain. He knew that the grief in it would ring in his ears forever. The gray fox stood waiting for Will to look at it, grinning, red tongue rolling from a mouth dripping and brighter with red blood. It stared straight at him with an unmistakable sneering snarl. Then it loped off across the field straight as an arrow and disappeared over the farm edge. Bran was on his knees by the dog, sobbing, cradling the white head on his lap. He called desperately to the fall, fondling his ears, dropping his cheek just once, and longing to rest against the smooth neck. 
but there was nothing to be done. The chest was a shattered ruin. The silver eyes were glazed, unblinking. Kafal was dead. Murdering bloody dog, Pritchard was babbling with fury, still <coughs> in a kind of savage contentment. You'll kill no more of my sheep. A damn good riddance. He was just after the fox. He was trying to save your old sheep. Brain choked on his words and wept. What are you talking about? A fox? Dang old boy, you are as mad as the dog. Pritchard broke the shell out of his gun, his pudgy face contemptuous. Owen Davies was down on his knees beside Bram. Come, mock him, said, he said, his voice gentle. There was no fox anywhere. Kafal was going for the sheep. There is no question. We all saw. He was a lovely dog, a beauty. His voice shook and he cleared his throat, but he must have gone mad, bad in the head. I cannot say I would not have shot him myself in Caroline's place. That is the right of it. Once a dog turns killer, it's the only thing to do. His arm was tight round Bram's shoulders. Bram looked up at the rest of them, blindly tugging off his glasses and rubbing hand over his eyes. He said, hi, incredulous. But did none of you see the fox? The big gray fox that Kafal jumped as it went to kill the sheep? John Rowland said, his voice deep in compassionate. No, Bram. There was no fox, Bram, David Evans said. I'm sorry. Boy, Bach. Come on, no. Let your father take you to Cloid. We will bring Kafal after you. Ah, said Pritchard with a sniff. You can get that carrion out of my yard as soon as you like, yes, and pay the vet's bill when I have that have had that sheep seen to as well. Kid did the gig, cared on Pritchard, said Will's uncle. There will be talk of all this sheep attacking business later. You can have a little feeling for the boy, surely. Cared on Pritchard looked at, at him, his small eyes bright and expressionless. He motioned to one of his men to take the wounded sheep away, then he spat casually on the ground and walked off to his farmhouse. A woman was standing in the doorway. She had not moved through everything that had happened. Bran's father helped him to his feet and led him away. Bran seemed dazed. He looked at Will blankly, as if he had not been there. David Evans said glumly, Wait a minute. There is some sacking in the car. I will come and find it. John Rowland stood beside Will in fine rain, sucking at an empty pipe, looking reflectively down at the still white body with a dreadful red gash in its chest. He said, And did you see this fox, Will Stanton? Yes, Will said. Of course. He was in front of us as clear as you are now. It had tried to attack us on Bird Rock, and Kafal chased it down here, but none of you could see it. So nobody will ever believe us, will they? John Rollins was silent for a moment. He creased his creased brown face unreadable. Then he said, Sometimes in these mountains there are things that it is very hard to believe, even when you have seen them with your own very eyes. For instance, there is Kafal, and with our eyes we saw him alone jump at the sheep. And indeed something did sink its teeth into the sheep's throat, and it must have got a bloody mouth doing it, for there was blood all over the sheep's fleece, and it was lucky to be alive. And yet it is a strange thing, which will not go out of my mind, that although poor Kafal lies there with his own blood all over his broken chest, there is no blood on his mouth at all. Part 2, The Sleepers. The Girl from the Mountains. Will said, excuse me, Mr. Davies, is Bran home from school yet? Owen Davies jerked upright. He had bent over the engine of the tractor in one of the farm outhouses. His thin hair was ruffled and his face smeared with oil. I'm sorry, Will said. I made you jump. No, no, boy, that is all right. I was just a bit further away than this engine, I think. He made the quick apologetic grimace that seemed to be as near as he ever came to a smile. All the lines on his thin face seemed to lead to nowhere. Will thought, no expression ever. Bran is home, yes. I think you will find him in the house, or up by his light, worried voice trailed away. Will said softly, like a fall. They had buried the dog the evening before up on the lower slope of the mountain of the heavy stone of the grave to keep predators away. Yes, I think so. Up there, Owen Davies said. Will wanted suddenly to say something, but the words were slippery. Mr. Davies, I'm sorry about that. All of it. Yesterday. It was awful. Well, yes, now. Thank you. Owen Davies was embarrassed, flinching from the contact of emotion. He said, looking down into the tractor's engine. It couldn't be helped. You can never tell when a dog may take it into his head to go for the sheep. It is one in a million, but it can happen. Even the best dog in the world. He looked up suddenly, and for once his eyes met Will's though they seemed to be looking out at him but beyond into the future or the past. His voice came firmer, like that of a younger man. I do think, mind you, that Caradoc Pritchard was very ready to shoot the dog. That is something very drastic and not done normally to another man's creature, at any rate not before his face. We were all there. It would have been nothing to catch Kafal. A sheep chaser can sometimes be given a home somewhere away from sheep without having to be killed. But I cannot say this to Bran, and nor must you either. It would not help him. His eyes flicked away again, and Will watched fascinated and disturbed as the bright echo of another time dropped away like a coat and left the familiar drab Owen Davies with his humorless, slight, slightly guilty air. Well, Will said, I think you are right, but no, I wouldn't mention that to Bran. I'll go and look for him now. Yes, Owen Davies said, eagerly turning his anxious, helpless face to the hills. Yes, you could help him, I believe. 
but Will knew as he trudged along the muddy lane that there was a small chance he or any one of the lights could comfort Brandon. When he reached the edge of the valley where the land began to climb, he saw very small and distant above him. Halfway up the mountain, the figure of John Rollins like a toy man. His two dogs, black and white specks, moved to and fro. Will looked irresolute at the place further down the valley where Bran would be gone to earth, along with his misery. Then on an instinct, he began to climb straight up through the Brocken and Gorse. John Rollins might be a good person to talk to first. Nevertheless, it was Bran he, he first saw. He came upon him suddenly without expecting it. He was parting up the part way up the slope, panting hard as he still did on rising ground, and as he paused for breath, raising his head, he saw there before him sitting on a rock the familiar figure, dark jeans and sweater, white hair like a beacon, smoky glasses over the pale eyes, but the glasses were not visible now, nor the eyes, for Brand sat with his head bent down, immobile, even though Will knew he must have heard the noisy puffing of his approach. He said, Hello, Bran. Bran. Bran raised his head slowly, but said nothing. Will said, There was no dog like him ever, anywhere. No, there was not, Bran said. His voice was small and husky. He sounded tired. Will cast about to find words of comfort, but his mind could not help but use the wisdom of an old one. And that was not the way to reach Bran. He said, It was a man that killed him, Bran, but that is the price we have to pay for the freedom of men on the earth, that they can do the bad things as well as the good. There are shadows in pattern as well as sun as sunlight. Just as you once told me, Kafal was no ordinary dog. He was a part of the long pattern, like the stars in the sea, and nobody could have played his part better, nobody in the world. Whole world. The valley was quiet under its brooding gray sky. Will heard only a song, thrush trilling from a tree. Then the scattered voices of sheep on the slopes, so a faint humming from the distant road of a passing car. Bran raised his head and took off his glasses. The tiny eyes were swollen and red-rimmed in his white face. He sat there, hunched, knees bent up, arms dangling limp over them. Go away, he said. Go away. I wish you had never come here. I wish I had never heard of the light and the dark and your danged old merriment and his rhymes. If I had your golden heart now, I'd throw it in the sea. I am not a part of your stupid quest anymore. I don't care what happens to it. And Kafal was never a part of it either, or a part of your pretty pattern. He was my dog, and I loved him more than anything in the world, and now he's, he is dead. Go away. The red rimmed glasses, uh, eyes, he stared cold and unwinking at Will for a long moment, and then Bran put back his smoky glasses and turned his head to look out across the valley. It was a dismal. Without a word, Will stood straight again and plodded on up the hill. It seemed a long time before he, he reached John Rollins, the lean leathery sheepman was crouched half kneeling over a broken fence, mending it from a prickly skein of barbed wire. He sat back on his heels as Will came panting up and looked at him through narrowed eyes. <clears throat> his, seamed brown, his seamed brown face crinkled against the brightness of the sky. With no greeting, he said, this is the top level of the quid pasture here. The hill farms have the grazing beyond, the fences to keep our sheep below, but they are crafty, beggars at bre breaking it, especially now the rams are out. Will nodded miserably. John Rollins looked at him for a moment, then got up and beckoned him over to a high outcropping of rock a little way up the mountain. They sat down on its lee side. Even there, the place was like a lookout post, covering the whole valley. Will glanced around him briefly, his senses alert, but the Grey King still lay with dawn. The valley was as quiescent as it had been since the moment Kafal had died. John Rowland said, There is the rest of the fence to check, to check, but I am ready for a break. I have a thermos here. Would you like a mouthful of tea, Will? He gave him the thermos top brimming with bitter brown tea. Will surprised himself by drinking thirstily. When he had finished, John Rowland said softly, Did you know you were sitting near Cadman's way here? Will looked at him sharply, and it was not the look of an 11-year-old, and he did not trouble to disguise the fact. Yes, he said, of course I did, and you knew that I knew, and that's why you mentioned it. John Rowland sighed and poured himself some tea. I dare say, he said in a curious tone that had envy in it, that you could now walk blindfold all the way from Twin to... Mackinoff, over the hills on Cadman's Way, even though you had never been to this country before. Will pushed back his straight brown hair, damp on his forehead from the climbing. The old ways are all over Britain, he said, and we can follow on anywhere once we have found it. Yes. He looked out across the valley. It was Bran's dog who found it for me up here, in the beginning, he said sadly. John Rollins pushed back his cloth cap, scratched his head, and pulled it forward again. I have heard of you people, he said, all my life on and off, though not so much these days. More when I was a boy, and I even used to think I met one of you once when I was very young, though I dare say it was only a dream. Now I have been thinking about the way the dog died, and I have talked a bit to young and I have talked a bit to young Bran. He broke off and Will looked nervously to see what he might say next, but did not choose to use his art to find out. And I think, Will Stanton, said the sheepman, that I ought to be helping you in any way that you might need. But I do not want to know what you are doing. I do not want you to explain it to me at all. Will felt suddenly as the sun had burst out. Thank you, he said. 
The smaller of John Rowland's dogs, Tip, came quietly over and sat down at his feet, and he rubbed the silky ears. John Rowland looked down over the Brocken slope. Will's gaze followed his. Just above the blackened land where the fire had grazed, they could see the tiny figure that was Bran, still sitting hunched with his back to them, his white head propped on his knees. This is a very bad time for Bran Davies, the shepherd said. I'm glad he talked to you, Will said bleakly. He wouldn't talk to me, not that I blame him. He'll be so lonely without the fall. I mean, Mr. Davies is nice, but not exactly. And not having any mother, too. That makes it worse. Bran never knew his mother, John Rowland said. He was too small. Will said curiously, what was she like? Rollins drank his tea, shook the cup dry, and screwed it back on the flask. Her name was Gwen, he said. He held the flask absentmindedly in his hands, looking past into it, into his memory. She was one of the prettiest things you will ever see. Small with a clear, fair skin and black hair and blue eyes like Speedwell, and a smiling light in her face that was like music. But she was a strange wild girl, too. Out of the mountains she came, came and never would tell where she came from, or how. He turned abruptly and looked hard at Will, with the dark eyes that seemed always to be narrowed against fierce weather. I should have thought, he said, with sudden belligerence, that being what you are, you would know all about Bran. Will said gently, I don't know anything about Bran, except what he has told me. We are not really so very different from you, Mr. Rowlands, most of us. Only our masters are different. We do know many things, but they are not things that intrude on the lives of men, and that we are like anyone else. We know only what we have lived through, or what somebody has told us. John Rollins nodded his head, relenting. He opened his mouth to say something, stopped, pulled his pipe from his pocket, and poked at its contents with one finger. Well, he said slowly, perhaps I should tell you the story from the start. It will help, help you to understand Brand. He knows some of it well enough himself. Indeed, he thinks about it so much on his own that I wish he had never been told. Will said nothing. He sat closer to Tip and put one arm around his neck. John Rollins lit his pipe. He said through the first cloud of smoke, it was when Owen Davies was a young man working at Pritchard's farm. Old Mr. Pritchard was alive in those days. Caradog worked for his father, too, waiting to take over and run the place, though he wasn't a patch on Owen for work. Owen was sheepman for Pritchard. A solitary chap he was, even then. He was living in a cottage on his own, out on the moor, closer to the sheep than to the farm. He puffed out some more smoke and glanced at Will. You have been at that cottage. It is deserted now. Nobody has lived there for years. That place? Where you left the sheep after? Startled Will saw again in his mind the figure of John Rowland staggering into the little empty stone house in the bracket with a wounded sheep draped over his shoulders and blood from its fleece on its neck, on his neck. The little house from which when they had come back half an hour later the herd sheep had vanished without any trace. That place, yes. And one wild night in the winter, with rain and a north wind blowing, there was a knocking at Owen's door. It was a girl, out of nowhere, half frozen with, a wo with walking through the storm, and worn off from carrying her baby. Her baby? John Rowland looked down the down the mountain at Brand's hunched figure, sitting lonely on his rock. A sturdy little chap the baby was, a few months old. She had him in a kind of sling on her back. The only strange thing about him, Owen saw, was that he had no color in him. White face, white hair, white eyebrows, and very odd tiny eyes, like the eyes of an owl. Will said slowly, I see. Owen took the girl in, John Rowland said. He got her back to life gradually with much care that night and the day after. And the baby too, though babies are tough creatures and he was not in such a bad way. And before 24 hours were even gone, Owen Davies was, even, was more in love with that strange, beautiful girl than I had ever seen a man love a woman. He had never loved anyone much before. Very shy was Owen. It was like a dam bursting. With a man like that, it is dangerous. When at last he loves, he gives all his heart without care or thinking, and it may never go back to him for the rest of his life. He stopped for a moment, compassion softening his weathered, lying face, and sat in silence. Then he said, well, there they were then. The next day, Owen went off to the sheep, leaving the girl to rest in the cottage. On the way home, he stopped at my house on Kowid here to get some milk for the baby. We had always been friends since he was a boy, even though I am older. I was not there, but my wife was, and he told her about Gwen and the baby. My bloated, bloated one was a warm heart and a good ear. She said he was like a man on fire, glowing. He had to tell somebody. Far down on the lower slope, Bran got up from his rock and began roaming aimlessly through the brock and peering about as though he were looking for something. When Owen came back to his cottage, John Rowland said, he heard screaming. He had never heard a woman scream before. There was a strange dog outside the door, Caradog Pritchard's dog. Owen went into the house like a wire snapping, and he found the girl struggling with Caradog. He had come looking to see why Owen had not been at work the day before, like had Caradog, and found Gwen there instead, and decided in his dirty way that she must be a light woman and easy for him to take if he fancied her. John Rollins leaned deliberately to one side and spat into the grass. Excuse me, Will, he said, but that is how I feel when my mouth has been talking about Caroline Pritchard. What happened? What did he do? 
but was lost in wonder at this mist of romance surrounding Dan with ordinary Owen, Davy, Owen Davies. Owen, he went mad. He has never been a fighter, but he threw Caradog out of the door and went after him, and he broke his nose and knocked out two of his teeth. Then I arrived, and a good thing I did, or he would have killed the man. Blow one had sent me with some things for the baby. I took Caradog home. He wouldn't have the doctor called. Afraid of the scandal he was, I cannot say I had very much sympathy for him. His nose has not looked quite the same shape since. He glanced down the slope again. Bran's right head was still bent over the ground as he moved slowly, meaninglessly, to and fro. Bran may be glad of your company soon, Will. There is not much more to tell, really. One more day and one more night, the girl Gwen stayed with Owen in the cottage, and he asked her to marry him. He was such a happy man. The light shone out of him. We saw them for part of that day, and she seemed just as joyful, too. But then, just about dawn, on the next morning, the fourth day, Owen was wakened by the baby's crying, and Gwen was not there. She had vanished. No one knew where she had gone, and she never came back. Will said, Bran told me she died. Bran knows she disappeared, John Rowan said, but perhaps it is more comfortable to believe that your mother died than to think of her running away and leaving you without a second thought. That's what she did? Just disappeared and left the baby behind? John Rowan's nodded. In a note, it said, His name is Bran. Thank you, Owen Davies. And that was all. Wherever she went, she has never been seen or heard of since nor she, will she ever be. Owen came to us with the baby that morning. He was out of his head crazy with losing Gwen. He went up into the hills and did not come down for three days, looking for her, you see. People heard him calling Gwenny, Gwenny. Lord Gwen and Mrs. Mrs. Evans, your auntie, looked after Bran between them. A good baby he was. Old man Pritchard gave Owen the sack, of course. About that time, your uncle David lost the man, so he took Owen on, and Owen moved to the cottage on Quid, where he lives now. And he brought Bran up as his son. Will said, that's right, with everybody's help. There was a bit of to do, but he was allowed to adopt the boy in the end. Most people ended up thinking Bran really was Owen's son. And the one thing that Bran has never been told is that he is not. He believes that Owen is his father. He must take care you never suggest anything different. I shall, Will said. Yes, I have no worries about you. Sometimes I think Owen believes Bran is, a, is his real son, too. He was always strict chapel, you see, and afterwards he turned even more to his religion. Perhaps you cannot understand this quite, Will Block, but because Bo Owen knew it was wrong by the rules of his faith to live those few days alone in the same house with Gwen, then he began to feel that it was just as much wrong as if he and Gwenny, not married to each other, had had a baby together, as if the two of them had produced Bran. So when he thinks of Bran, still to this day, it is mostly with love, but a little bit with guilt, for no good reason mine except in his own conscience. He has too much conscience, has Owen. The people do not care, even the people of his chapel. They think Bran is his natural son, but the tut-tutting was over long ago. They have brains enough to judge a man by what he has proved himself to be, not by some mistake he may or may not have made a long time ago. John Rowan sighed and stretched, knocked out his pipe, and ground the ashes into the earth. He stood up. The dogs jumped to his side. He looked down at Will. There was all this at the back, he said, when Caradoc Pritchard shot Bran Davies' dog. Will picked a single blast blossom from a gorse bush beside him. It shone bright yellow on its rubby hand. People are very complicated, he said sadly. So they are, John Rawls said. His voice deepened a little, louder and clearer than it had been. But when the battles between you and your adversaries are done, Will Stanton, in the end, the fate of all the world will depend on just those people, and how many of them are good or bad, stupid or wise. And indeed, it is also complicated that I would not dare foretell what they will do with their world, our world. He whistled softly. Turned your mouth, pen, tip. Carefully, he picked up his loop of barbed wire, and with the dogs following, he walked away beside the fence over the hill.